I would say thank you, Anne and Rosalie, for this invention of being able to have these kinds of events here, hosted here, and Cooper Union for hosting this kind of adventure, and for inviting me to introduce and moderate the conversation of the remarkable work of Kieran Timberlake and what we will hopefully see tonight. It's a huge pleasure to introduce them both because uh, Steve Kieran and James Timberlake are like very few architects today. Their work embodies an expansive ideal of what architects can accomplish, and very few understand what it means to connect social, cultural, and environmental values into design, fabrication, and research, and view this as the underpinning to inform all they do. Within these frameworks, they've created projects that are reshaping the way we think about the edges that have been separated between conception and construction, between environmental dreams and construction, and codified checklists are out the door as cultural and institutional projects can be informed by larger dreams. Their projects perform at so many levels that describing them simply as architecture is inadequate. Kieran Timberlake's work invites us to expand the definition of what an architectural practice can and should do. Their work is tremendously relevant to the complex environmental, social, and technological circumstances that characterize our time, and I would even add financial challenges as well. Kieran Timberlake's practice grew naturally, or so I think, um, from their early years working at the office of Venturi Scott Brown, where complexity and contradiction were more compelling than the purity of a more conventional practice. Perhaps the inspiration of Bob Benitez's Benitez parallel paths in practice and teaching uh, and publishing had created a foundation for what I would call their triple, now quadruple, commitments to research, practice, teaching, and invention. From their self-generated test, if you will, and nearly instantaneously constructed Loblolly House to the slightly more, and I put in quotes, deliberate speed of arrival of the imminent London Embassy, their projects are always seriously considered, strategically imagined, and exquisitely detailed. While each of their projects addresses their programs intelligently, they also have embedded in their work and their books the underpinnings of a manifesto. This is also true in their teaching, and I've had the great pleasure of teaching side by side with them at Penn in the graduate research studios at University of Pennsylvania, and Michael and I have deeply admired their practice. They've managed to treat their projects, their practice, and their publications and research studios as one collective project, enabled by their highly diverse and talented staff, which, by the way, they have grown and enriched with incredible intention. In fact, they've designed their office as intelligently as any practice I can imagine. They have demonstrated the possibility of an entirely new set of relationships between concept and construction, shaping the outcome that benefits from continuity rather than interruption between different types of expertise. It is a calculated redesign of the profession as we know it. Kieran Timberlake's contrib contributions to the profession and discipline are immense, and just to name a few of their remarkably diverse projects, I'll talk about ones that we know well. The cellophane, ha cellophane house at MoMA, which generates its own energy, if you will, and a portable skin. The Lillian, house, uh, Lillian Hall at Penn. Cornell University West Campus. The sculpture building at Art Gallery at Yale and soon to be shared, I think, with the rest of the world, the US Embassy in London, which I really look forward to seeing this evening. It, these projects are really not so much just one project after another, but they're calculated steps in a kind of systematic research program. And you could say that they don't just do buildings, but they rather envision them as opportunities to advance, advance the agenda of our architecture. But they're equally committed academics, consummate professionals, and their numerous books point to the seriousness of their mutual endeavors. So just a highlight of a kind of resume, both Steve and James received their Master of Architecture at Princeton, and they've taught graduate level design and research studios at University of Pennsylvania. They've held visiting professorships at the University of Washington, Yale, and University of Michigan, and Princeton, among many other schools. And they are both fellows of the American Institute of Architects and the inaugural Benjamin Latrobe Prize Fellow. And their firm has won the USAIA Award, the Cooper uh, Hewitt National Design Award. And their projects have, read, uh, have, have received, at last count, well over 100 uh, honors and recognitions. So I think more importantly than all those acknowledgments and all those uh, sort of clear, sort of systematic things is that the work 
is beautiful, but they are incredibly intelligent um, and visionary individuals to know. So I think we're in for a great treat this evening, and I want to welcome uh, Steve Kieran and James Timberlake. Mary, and after that wonderful introduction, I think Steve and I will just stand down and click through the slides. I don't, I don't know that we can add anything to that. Thank you very much. President Sparks, Nader, uh, the Cooper Union, uh, the Architectural League, it's a great honor uh, for Steve and I to be in this hall uh, and in this, in this space with all of you. There's many colleagues, collaborators, clients, um, friends, and many others who are here, and we're grateful for you to be here. We want to take you through some projects in New York and London, but before we do that, we're going to begin with this image from Bangladesh. Steve and I have been taking a studio from Penn to Bangladesh for uh, eight of the last 10 years, and this image, I think, resonates with the two of us about the human condition and what architects and architecture uh, really should be addressing. And our bandwidth really takes that uh, into consideration along with um, looking at another aspect of the bandwidth, which is how to put things together and how to think about how those kinds of things um, come together. Where do we do this? Well, 130 people need space, and I think one of the things that we do um, is we've tried to find great spaces to work in together. This 60,000 square foot former uh, bottling plant in Philadelphia, you know, the sixth borough of New York, um, is a, a place that we can, um, you know, really, really uh, think widely and broadly about what we're doing. There's a shop. There's places to make things. Um, there's ample volumes and square feet of space to think broadly and deeply uh, and widely. And so throughout the arc of the day, you know, as the, as the sun moves through the space, obviously there's a, uh, a lot of activity that goes on between research, uh, uh, collaboration, and other aspects of making architecture. We try very much to be both a reflective and a projective practice. The reflective part is to think through writing and production of written documents, books mostly, um, lectures and talks. We try to reflect on everything we're doing. And then we try and project it uh, out to the world through various publications. So we try to be open with the profession at large, with our clients. Um, and with culture at large about what we do as architects and what architecture can contribute. A first New York project, we had an opportunity at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum here to do the first solos exhibition um, quite some time ago, back I believe in 2003. And uh, this was an opportunity for us to really ref project and start to think about the agency of materials that we were not yet using in architecture. And it was erected in the garden of the Cooper Hewitt. Um, you can see it in this image. And there are three parts to this exhibition. In the lower left corner of it is a prototype that I'll show you a detail of, of an architectural product, a material. Um, in the center, there's an exhibition uh, uh, that underlies and describes that product. And then there's a frame, a scaffold system, about which is wrapped uh, a PET skin uh, that is suggestive of how the product I'm going to share with you could actually become an architectural envelope. We think it's a significant photo. It happened to be taken against the backdrop of a Gothic church behind it. And for us, it's a way of thinking about the aesthetic of, uh, of a new building product in a way that could have some of the, art the artistic and aesthetic qualities uh, of stained glass in the years ahead. So, uh, you know, the basic idea of the product is that it's a printed skin 
as opposed to a, um, a, a conventional method of construction. We would print functionalities onto a plastic building envelope. Uh, that envelope really would then have uh, printed functions on it. You can see some of them in two different layers here. Some of these materials existed at the time, like printed circuitry is on that substrate. Others were nascent and were being printed at different scales, like organic light emitting diodes. Um, yet others were still on the horizon in terms of organic printed solar, now here today as we speak. Um, so it was an idea about what the envelopes we build with might look like in the future, how they might perform for us, and what aesthetic qualities they might give all of us to speculate with in the future. This was a scalable element. You know, we imagine that the PVs and the LEDs, the OLEDs, and some of the other uh, pieces that we uh, brought to this particular skin would get larger as they have, and over time, um, there would be a, a very different relationship between the window and wall and also between information and light and how all of that is in integrated. In this particular slide now, uh, nearly 17 years later, um, you know, my son um, is looking th out through this window of the future, if you will, looking to the past. I'm the guy taking the picture, so he's looking uh, out at the past. And I think this juxtaposition of uh, you know, him looking through the future, um, you know, beyond me, I think is always something that resonated with uh, Steve and me and resonates in the kind of work that we end up uh, doing. From Smart Wrap and the Cooper Hewitt, uh, we, about four years later, uh, we were one of initially about 800 architects and designers that were asked to participate um, and submit a proposal at MoMA uh, for an ex exhibition called Home Delivery. Some of you, many of you in the room, we hope, visited that show um, pre-recession in 2008. Um, and the brief of this was, can you deliver a house to the site um, in a prescribed amount of time, hopefully less than a month, leave it up for roughly five or five and a half months and then take it down within about a month uh, as well in order to clear the site. And so um, we made a proposition. This was post Lob Lally and post refabricating architecture. Uh, and so the, uh, you know, our a notion of this building becoming an, an experiment um, really in terms of both materiality and its disposition and uh, composition, but also in terms of delivering it to the site as a, as a kind of marker on refabricating architecture as a way of, again, proofing, uh, you know, our theory in that book that we could think differently logistically uh, and deeply about design and, uh, and, and, and bringing a building together. That building came together, 85% uh, of that building came together in six days, arrived on those trucks you saw earlier, um, and then f it took about 15 days to finish, uh, finish the rest of the project. Um, within that, there are a, a variety of experiments going on. One, uh, using a scaffold system or a Bosch Rexroth uh, aluminum uh, uh, structuring system you know, to basically um, make the scaffold of the house that was then infilled by a second generation version of the smart wrap walls, incorporating uh, photovoltaics. And then utilizing things like polycarbonate floors and stairs as a means of experimenting with those materials, um, thinking about mass production and mass uh, delivery, but also in terms of how those uh, materials come together, uh, both in terms of integrating with one another uh, and transferring light. This was a little house, and you can see that here, um, two buildings that have now unfortunately met their demise on the lot that has now obviously been replaced by uh, John Novell's tower. Um, uh, in Todd Billy's building uh, to the right and our, our uh, modest house uh, to the left. The, uh, this modest house you can see here poised in front of Saarinen's CBS building uh, 
we've had a lot of career intersections with Saarinen, and they continue to this day. This was one of the first to actually have um, our little tiny structure in front of his vast tower. Uh, but there have been others. We added to and renovated Morrison Stiles Colleges at Yale. And he, of course, was the architect for the US Embassy in London that we're replacing now. So um, lots of career intersections there. But we think what's remarkable about this little house is the glow from within. Every material in it is translucent or transparent. So at night, for a little house, the entirety of it, because all the floors glow and are translucent, becomes literally a lantern sitting um, way beyond its size and radiating light um, and welcome way beyond its size. Um, about 750,000 people walk through this home during the course of that exhibition. OK, moving just north of New York to Pound Ridge, um, we want to share with you a home we completed um, just a couple of years ago uh, for a client uh, who works here in the city. Uh, Michael and Olga Kagan are their names. And they uh, uh, bought a piece of property, about 35 acres, literally on Pound Ridge. And this is a view of us up on top of the ridge um, speculating on where to put the house. And the initial idea was to site it lower down, well below the ridge. And uh, when we were walking up there, it seemed as though, and the site is basically glacial. All these rock outcroppings you're, you've seen are really formed about 10 to 15,000 years ago in the last recession of the glaciers. And we found up there a couple of rooms that seemed to us to kind of be waiting for the house, literally. they were just the right size. They were one floor apart. Everything about them suggested um, that the house needed to go there. It's probably the swiftest decision about location on a property uh, that we've ever been able to make. It just seemed uh, a foregone conclusion. This is a little um, diagram of it I made on a placemat with some crayons when I was having dinner with my um, children over a Christmas holiday, just kind of trying to get a sense for this. We've just seen the site. But what, what you're looking at there, those red wavy lines are the, the, the rock outcroppings. The red lines that are filled in in between them are how the house sits in between those outcroppings. And the house on the left toward the top, that portion of the house has a garage under it, bedroom wings above it. And we could already see that the upper outcropping at the upper level um, would be the living spaces of the home. So you can already see the, the nascent form of that house starting to come to be. Um, we were very much you know, thinking about it literally in the context of those two rock rooms. And the rock rooms were the outer wall of the house. And these reflective walls were the inner wall. You can see it um, looking across the bridge that interconnects the two houses with a small ravine in between them. And then here, looking toward the front door um, with the upper house, a single story portion to your right, the ravine under the bridge in between, uh, and then the double story version with a rock base um, with the house sitting atop it uh, on the left. Uh, just several miles from this house is Philip Johnson's glass house in New Canaan. And we thought very much in this house of um, what would that house be from the 1950s today in the, the first quarter of the 21st century? What kind of a house would you do on a site like this? Would it be all glass again, or would it be something else? And um, there's a dialogue here. That, that portion of the house is about the same proportion as the glass house. I'm sure many of you know it, if not all of you. And, um, the idea here was that we were going to do a real, um, literally designed to passive house standards house, not literally passive house because of the way the owners operate it, but um, to those standards um, that was used a geothermal system to heat and cool it. So from an energy perspective, it was on the opposite spectrum, but we still wanted 
the qualities of being in the world that that glass house had. And that's fundamentally what um, this system of wall panels is about. Um, we, there are four different types of reflectivity inherent here. Um, one is polished stainless steel. A second one is brushed stainless steel. Um, a third is the glass itself, which reflects differently from both of those materials. And a fourth is just coated um, copper that receives shadows from the sun. And we thought of this in a very painterly way, literally, as taking those four ways of reflecting and refracting the world and organ organizing them on the facade of the building as a canvas. Um, you can see then from the south direction how the house sits with the living room extending out into the rock rooms. Um, behind the house, when you go up underneath the ravine, you can see the presence of those rocks on the back wall of the house, and you can see the glow of it during uh, the autumnal season um, and the refraction of the, that light in multiple ways, depending on whether or not you're looking at the brushed stainless steel, the the polished steel. Within the house, um, when you come into the entry level, you're down in the earth. It's stone down there, and the stair is stone coming up out of the house, and it transforms as you move up through the house into a wooden stair um, with views along the hallway. Um, looking toward that stair from the bridge, you can look across the bridge. You see outside, up the hill toward the ridge above, down the slope toward the ravine below, and straight ahead to the stair. Uh, the big living room of the house has an, an object in the middle of it uh, that houses a media room and the uh, portions of the kitchen. And those, in turn, open out into uh, the living room space. Uh, that living room uh, has everything in it, dining, um, kitchen, living space. And the windows are all carefully curated. They have an art collection. Um, we think of the windows as frames for the art of the site, um, in this case for a boulder on the back ridge side or upside of the house. So much of our work, as many of you know, engages the landscape. And this house is very much not only of the landscape, but in the landscape itself. And it, I think the pairing of images of this house in the seasons really um, points out the literal and phenomenal transparency that Steve was uh, mentioning earlier, but also uh, the house is kind of, in a way, a chameleon. It, it, it changes with the seasons. You know, Khan talked about how light, you know, transforms space and how that, you know, also helps us mark form. I think one of the things that um, we've also come to learn in all the materiality studies that we've done is that, you know, engaging materials in a, in, a, in a very different kind of way and trying to get them to engage the light, which you'll see also, I, I believe, um, in the uh, uh, London Embassy project uh, momentarily, really is about, you know, taking that, uh, that sort of edict from Khan uh, another, uh, another step further. Another project back here in New York at Houston and Mercer that many of you have probably heard of, and certainly past the very large hole uh, that is on the site at this particular point, taking down the Coles Field House is 181 Mercer Street, at some point to be named by uh, NYU, uh, a 750,000 square foot mixed use uh, building, very complex, athletics and recreation, several theaters, 50 some odd classrooms, student housing, uh, faculty housing, um, and common spaces, and a landscape, all incorporated into one building. So many small universities and, and educational institutions might uh, likely be housed in this one building by comparison, but this is just soon to be one aspect of, um, of NYU. And I'm, have to mention our partners here, Davis Brody Bond, um, you know, who have been uh, uh, really able and collaborative and creative partners with us. And we're very grateful, Will, uh, and for your 
your help and, and your partner's help as well. At Houston Mercer Street, the faculty housing uh, you know, rises um, at, on the north side um, at Green and Bleecker. Uh, and the walkway intersects with the local street near Silver Towers. Um, and as we move through this particular project, you can get a sense of the complexity of this program. Um, you know, a base of the building, you know, housing the recreation uh, and uh, athletics, and then um, the classrooms and theaters and the public spaces uh, forming the aggregation of the largest block of the building and the, the towers rising um, from that, all engaged by that uh, mid-level landscape that's um, part of the part of the structure. This is a this is a complex project that has, you know, as you imagine, all of you that have worked in New York, strict regulations on it, and you know, very strong um, edicts um, both in terms of um, the form, uh, the disposition, the number of entrances, where we can walk around the building, and so forth, and uh, yet trying to integrate this into uh, into the community and into the neighborhood in a way that just doesn't land the building, but uh, deeply engages and makes better uh, the neighborhood around it. And so you can imagine, like any uh, complex building of this sort, you go through a variety of iterations. In, ad in addition, you know, you reach out to your collaborative partners, among them uh, not only our partners DBB, but um, Pentagram as well, you know, trying to think about how to kind of think about the building in, in different kinds of ways. Um, this was one of the ideograms that they had kind of made, um, trying to unpack some of the language of the building as we were developing some of the facades. So, you know, just a brief walk um, from the outside at, at Mercer and Bleecker, but looking into the north lobby and then up through the stairs. And one of the things you can see from this video is that we've tried to reverse the normative relationship of, of program to wall. In other words, rather than put all the program up against the curtain wall and um, have all of those rooms sometimes utilized, but sometimes privatized, if you will, through uh, blind closing and other kinds of things. We've reversed that order and put the circulation to the outside, brought the commons through the building, and connected all of the public spaces in such a way that um, it deeply connects to the street um, um, uh, uh, throughout the day. And so in the building and outside of the building, you're constantly seeing people move through this as part of the fabric of the city. So the north lobby moves you up to the commons through the aegis of external stairs that are um, not external to the building, but certainly on the edge of the building so that people can be seen and see one another at the street. You arrive at the commons from two sides, from the north and south sides, and that's a through view from east to west, looking both out to Mercer but also out to Silver Towers. One of the longest views at that level in New York City, by the way, because it looks through Pace Towers um, to the Picasso and, uh, and to um, other uh, buildings beyond. Um, within it are the usual common sorts of programs, uh, study lounges, cafes, uh, places to meet, uh, and then the classrooms um, all work off of that. The massing was very complex, you know, trying to um, interpret but also um, bring you know, art to um, a very prescriptive um, envelope diagram that was um, positioned on this particular block um, and trying to um, imagine it not only as a campus, you know, uh, within the neighborhood uh, and of itself, but also um, reinterpret that um, upper portion of the skyline in such a way to enhance light and daylight into Mercer Street, into Green Street, uh, maintain some of the views from Silver Towers and some of the other uh, adjoining buildings in a way that the program initially was thought to just uh, create a wall. And um, we hope that um, both in terms of the glass skin and the transparency, um, you know, the building becomes this um, very engaged piece of New York City at, uh, at the lower Manhattan 
uh, level. And at the upper level of the city, there is another landscape space in this place, in this case, really a quadrangle within which the housing sits atop the block that contains um, the theaters and classroom spaces below. But you can see the engagement within the city there of a rather surprising um, rooftop landscape to go along with those uh, housing towers that rise above. Uh, in London, two projects we're going to conclude with uh, this evening. It's another point of intersection with Aero Saarinen for us, um, is the old London Embassy. And um, we had an opportunity to develop a scheme for the Qatari uh, uh, project, DR project, um, in London that made use of the old embassy, which will be vacated uh, later this year, by the beginning of next year, and turned into a hotel. So, and condominiums. Uh, and so, so um, you know, this particular, as, as you can see, the 1960s image of the, of the embassy, um, you know, with the street open in front. Uh, you could kind of imagine Saren and thinking, uh, you know, into the future about what was the life post-embassy of this particular building. And it converts quite nicely, believe it or not, to um, hotel and condominiums in terms of its kind of cellular nature of its exterior skin, um, but also the fact that the back, as you'll see in a moment, is kind of deeply carved out and has public program at its ground floor. The complex piece of this is that that particular embassy design, won by competition by Saren, and was a very, very complex facade system um, that is now listed in London uh, as historic, um, and eventually will have to be taken down bit by bit and then put back bit by bit as part of the restoration. So we began by unpacking Grosvenor Square and some of the security issues uh, that have been laden on you know, that site um, and trying to unpack the streets, open up the square, um, trying to return the fabric uh, back to the city uh, as they might have found it in 1960. And as you, many of you know, you know, Steve and I and the firm you know, deeply engaged the environment uh, in terms of trying to get our buildings to perform and perform well. And as part of the ethic, I think, of architects that um, we've tried to encourage uh, in each and every one of our projects. So one of the initial uh, um, efforts of trying to unpack how you kind of carve out the old uh, embassy program and then reposition new program back in it was also to understand what the impact of that might be on its energy gathering and energy uh, remitting uh, aspects um, and also trying to get daylight and views uh, into this section as well. The diagram, you know, lent itself to a kind of um, hotel layer that, you know, looks to the uh, street and not to Grocer Square, and then the condominiums on top and at the back um, over you know, part of the former consular section. And you can see the diagram of just unpacking the structure and the facade and the landscape, how those bits, you know, kind of all come together. That section here reinterpreted again, you know, really literally carving the building out and then putting this hospitality program back in, but also creating a landscape, a privatized landscape on the roof, uh, meeting rooms, uh, restaurants, and so forth. But one of the more complex pieces here was how do you insert the program in while, you know, maintaining this facade? And what we try, attempted to do and convinced Qatari DR was to turn this into a performative layer, turn this into an active curtain wall by inserting a wall behind the old wall so that the old wall didn't have to do the environmental work any longer, but participated in that event. Um, so just a view, you know, maintaining, you know, the external expression of the London Embassy, the new hotel, uh, entrance from Grosvenor Square, the condominium entrances from the two side streets, and of course service uh, reaching out to the muse at the back. Just a, a, a remapping of that 
uh, that new landscape, a shared surface in front of the hotel, restoring some of the car access through London, which they like to do, but do it in a shared surface way, um, and, and deeply uh, attempting to knit this, um, this building now back into the square by reducing and calming um, you know, the traffic and, and pedestrianizing the, the area. Just a view with the added layer of condominiums up on the top that kind of cascade down um, the west side of the building. A view of the, Lydia will recognize this, um, the, you know, the main public space in Saarinen's uh, 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 main hall coming into the embassy, but now reinterpreted uh, into a hotel lobby. Um, uh, you know, but uh, utilizing the kind of faux uh, fictive structure um, that um, laced the, um, actually it's real structure that laces uh, this particular ceiling um, that was part of the listing uh, of the building and then just part of the hospitality uh, in that space. Steve, I think this is you. Okay. So uh, just to wrap up on uh, the old London Embassy, you can see this view looking at it from the back side here, you know, with those spaces cascading down, opening out um, um, to the south across the city. So, um, the new London Embassy. Uh, we've been with this project for a while. It was a competition that was um, conducted in 2009, I believe, if I'm correct, mostly. And, um, and uh, there were four finalists for it. Frances Hall's been this year, this evening with us. She was one of the jurors um, uh, for that project. And uh, there, there were four finalists for it, and uh, we were certainly honored to come away with that. It, uh, we were competing against Paycob, Freed, Richard Meyer, and uh, Morphosis for this at the end of the day. So uh, in this image, you can see it. Uh, about six weeks ago or so, um, nearing completion. It's going to be concluded. The uh, work on it will be finished this fall. They've already started moving into it, um, be occupied later in the fall into the early winter. The artwork finished then. So it's nearing completion. So we're going to share with you this evening some diagrams and drawings of it, some of which go back to the competition stages along with um, photographs of the building um, as it is today. So um, you can see the base, the site here, uh, which will appear again and again with the Thames to the left uh, of the building, Nine Elms Lane adjoining it. Uh, a, a series of views of it, you know, we're looking basically um, up the Thames here toward the west. Um, you can see the building more or less in the middle of that screen. Uh, it's uh, on the south bank of the Thames, immediately opposite Pimlico, that big green space you can see across the hoped for once, once upon a time uh, bridge that will be built across, goes across to Pimlico um, in order to position it. So it's actually quite close to central London, and uh, that was a major feet at the start of this project was, frankly, the acquisition of this site. There was real concern that they would have to move out of London. Um, they did not. They found a site, and this site is very central. It's between Vauxhall and Battersea stations on the south side of, of the Thames. So th this is the, the view before um, we found the site, or as we found the site, and before the demolition began. Um, so you, what you can see really is an industrial site, fundamentally, um, poised in between Vauxhall Station on the bottom lower left of the slide and um, Battersea Station um, above. So it was basically all low-rise, back-of-house support spaces for central London, things like um, FedEx, Royal Mail, car dealers, Bentley dealers, of course, in London, and Rolls-Royce dealers, that sort of thing were all housed there along with the Covent Garden flower market. But basically low-rise industrial sheds really fundamentally right in the center of the city. And the decision of the embassy to move there um, galvanized, frankly, a, a vast development. This is probably the, the largest single development district in London to this day. 
Um, and you can see, um, lastly here, looking, in this case, to the east, if you look carefully on the left side, you'll see the Houses of Parliament, um, the London Eye, things like that. In the upper left corner is the Thames Curves around um, to the north over there. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can get a good sense of where this site situates itself and how this building sits squarely in the middle of, kind of as the, the gem at the center of this new development district along Nine Elms Lane in London. So it began with a proposal that went into the Department of State, OBO, uh, Overseas Building Operations. 39 firms submitted qualifications. Uh, they whittled that down to 12. Uh, they interviewed 12. Um, upon those interviews, they whittled the team, the, the firms down to four, and Steve mentioned the four, um, and asked um, for us all to participate in a, in a design competition. Um, uh, mirroring, you know, what, what um, Sarah and I had gone through, obviously, you know, nearly 60 years before with the previous embassy. Um, and so we began. And where we began at a variety of levels was one unpacking about a 483-page uh, program brief that was extremely detailed. I think when we printed it out, uh, it stood about this tall, uh, single-sided on the floor. Um, and, you know, deeply um, began to not only um, look at a variety of uh, issues in terms of landscape, in terms of sustainability issues, in terms of the program, uh, and in terms of um, some of the other design elements that we might begin to think about bringing to the table. But one of the most important exercises I think we took was we took time to unpack the question of openness and transparency, equality, welcoming. What did that mean? What did that mean culturally? What did that mean in terms of an expression of imagery uh, and expression of architecture? Um, and because we knew this building had a 50-year to 100-year legacy, this was something going to be on the skyline. This was different than some of the some of the projects that we had been exposed to. We really wanted to have the opportunity to take the time and really unpack, you know, um, both from art, architecture, landscape, music, uh, a variety of things that began to kind of inform uh, what that meant. And this was among this slide. Uh, chronicles uh, about uh, 400 of about a thousand images that we gathered, um, both of American, you know, cultural uh, legacies, but also looking at uh, even some um, UK uh, culture as well. The fundamental siting strategy was arrived at quite quickly in some regards, and. Um, a hotel, at a hotel, a hotel in London, with L'Oreal and in London. The three of us over a drink. So, uh, a number of drinks, as I recollect, yeah. but um, what's uh, an idea that's not well lubricated, huh? <laughs> so, um, there, there are basically bands of movement along the Thames. The Thames is clearly one, the major water f that, about which the whole city of London is formed. But paralleling it in this part of London is a significant regional road, Nine Elms Lane. Um, and then yet further in is the network rail line. So uh, Nine Elms Lane and the network rail line both parallel the Thames with this swath of property in between it uh, that was a collection of warehouses that we shared with you earlier. So. Uh, there were planning strategies developed for the whole of this district that we interfaced with during the design competition and beyond. It's a vast swath of land. Over um, 50,000 residential units are largely underway. Many of them already built in this area. And um, uh, so part of the planning effort suggested that this realm in between the um, in, in between Nine Elms Lane, in between the highway and the, re, the, the network rail line, 
could be basically largely a pedestrianized environment. So there's a greenway down the middle of it um, that you can see in that green line. So that's basically the lineation of the site uh, that we found. And the basic idea we had at the outset was connecting it. Uh, I'm not sure what's causing all the rumbling there, but um, we'll work through it. Um, the basic idea was that um, we were proposing that there could be a pedestrian connection that would take you across the Thames. Um, and Laurie kept saying at the time, if you draw it, they'll build it. Um, they almost built this. It stopped at the moment, but it'll hap happen someday. And that that would basically um, wrap in a spiral shape as a landscape around our building and tie it together laterally across these strands of movement uh, from the network rail line um, to Nine Elms Lane along the Thames. Um, and that that form, that kind of spiraling into the site from beyond it, would continue up into and around and through the building. So this slide I talked to earlier, those several hun hundreds of images, almost a thousand images, one of the one of, the, one of the things, just to step aside from the embassy just for a second, one of the, the things that people say about here in, in Timberlake is your buildings don't look alike. They don't, you know, you don't have necessarily a signature style. And I think that's probably true, and we're, I think, quite happy about that. But I think one thing that you can say is that some of the ideas that we've begun with over the course of 33 years of partnership and some of the investigations and research that we've been doing, you know, come forward and they come forward in unusual ways. And in this particular case, on the right hand side of that image is cellophane house, um, represented with American crystal and the lighthouse, um, you know, the beacon from the lighthouse. And I think one of the things that we arrived at was that openness and transparency, that sense of a beacon, that sense of being able to engage this building visually, um, both inside and out, um, and have that also engage the city of London, um, and also have it not be foreboding, um, but open and welcoming, was a critical piece of the kind of cultural interpretation of some of the imagery that we were, that we were seeing. I think it's important. Um... Obviously, there are huge security concerns associated with an embassy of the United States anywhere in the world today. Public buildings, frankly, of the government of the United States anywhere in the world, including in our own country. So um, when you read that manual that James described, that multi-volumed um, program manual for the building, one interpretation of it would be that it's a bunker, frankly. And we felt symbols matter. Let me just go back to this for one moment. No, they, ma yeah. they matter a lot. <laughs> and um, we thought it was critical to put a stake in the ground saying we could find a way to design this building that is secure but radiates you know, fundamental values of our democracy that's a beacon and not a bunker. And that was a fundamental beginning point on this. And some of these images, frankly, helped us kind of fixate in our own mind that um, notion of the beacon, of the embassy as a beacon uh, of our democracy in the world. And um, uh, so that, that was a place we began. The other thought we had at the outset was you know, people that are not Americans the one thing they know about us that everybody knows is our national parks. It's our landscape. It's our grounds. Um, it's the, you know, the, the, the fabric of our country. And um, one of the thoughts was that we would bring that fabric into the building. Uh, and you can start to see here some landscapes, some American landscapes um, uh, suggested here. So. It was early from the outset in some of those early meetings with Lori Olin, um, this idea of this landscape weaving onto the site and then from the site up into and through the building. 
So that strand that Steve talked about, you know, is wound around the building. It's brought through the landscape. The landscape then becomes a way of helping us manage um, the, some of the security requirements that we have to do. And we can do that um, in a way that um, is quite, uh, ex quite accessible, um, but also inaccessible. Um, and uh, so that landscape wraps around, but then how do you, how do you engage this landscape? And one of, the, one of the things that I think Steve and Laurie and I spent the most amount of time talking about was not about landing this building in a landscape or in a city, but really having this building you know, come out of the city and come out of um, the strands, the four strands that Steve talked about, the new greenway, tying the building into that rather than having it set apart. How do you do that? Well, the landscape becomes that, that ambassador, if you will, to the Greenway uh, on the outside. But it also, in four and a half roughly acres, just under five acres of land, there were quite a bit of programmatic requirements that had to go around uh, the edge of the building, you know, entrance pavilions, um, uh, ceremonial lawns, um, access ways and service, of course, um, you know, that had to be incorporated within that. But how then do you not keep that from becoming so bound up and so off-putting to, uh, to the neighborhood of the city that um, people don't feel, you know, welcome to walk into this new landscape that's part of the city. And so therefore the pond in the foreground became essentially an extension of the Greenway and part of the, part of the um, a kind of belongs to the embassy, belongs to the uh, Department of State and the US government, but it's very much an accessible area that uh, brings you up close to the building um, that um, still is secure uh, and separates, um, you know, uh, you know, just random uh, access to, to the building and structures. Then that landscape was wound up through the, the, the building and it became a series of pathways through the building connecting six gardens um, that um, were all themed um, um, toward uh, American landscapes throughout the United States. And we'll show you those in just a minute. So the uh the, the volumetric diagrams that started to come out of this are depicted here. The building's a 10-story building on a colonnade that wraps around the base of it. Um, we felt it was absolutely critical that this building be open at the base. Um, and a lot of embassies are not. They're solid at the base. And what we did was we moved the solid wall back and developed an open colonnade around the base on which the volume sat. Um, you can see here the way the landscape starts to engage it, entries engage it. You move into the building, and like all um, office buildings, and the primary program here, frankly, is offices um, with some significant public spaces um, you know, for other embassy functions down on the lower levels, but primarily it's an office building. So it has a core in the center of it, but. One of the other features of these gardens is that they allow you to walk and continue that spiral walk through the building and move up through the building by moving through the gardens. So, or down. Um, or down. So there's another way to circulate, you can circumambulate literally um, spirally through the building, through this series of gardens. And it's practical on one level. It allows people to move floor to floor um, without necessarily going into the core of the building. Um, but beyond that, it creates this notion of a passage from the landscape beyond and outside into the core of the building, um, weaving through the fabric of, uh, of the entire building. One of the diagrams we didn't show was a series of you know, nearly 50 diagrams trying to look at both the disposition of that office program and its orientation. You know, whether it, was it a slab? Was it a series of slabs? Was it round? Was it cubic? Was it, you know, um, how did it sit? What was its orientation on the site? How was that part of an energy gathering and energy uh, remitting scheme, if you will? 
Um, how did we get abundant natural light into the building? What was the best environmental orientation for the building? Ultimately, we, you know, we settled on this building, you know, uh, being oriented true north, south, east, west, um, so that it faced through a gap to, to the Thames um, toward Pimlico. Um, but it allowed us to lower the environmental footprint of this particular building quite significantly. Then the question became, well, if this is a potentially a glass building for that openness and transparent uh, nature of, you know, not only trying to get abundant natural light into the, you know, the uh, 21st century workplaces, you know, how do we, um, how do we um, control that light? How do we organize that light? Can that um, light be also part of an energy gathering scheme as well. So these series of, of sketches began to think about, well, we know we think we have something rather cubic. And one of the other things that we had to think about was a very, very strict outer um, perimeter shell that we couldn't uh, exceed. It was a view shed diagram coming from the Houses of Parliament. Uh, and, the, uh, and the bridge at the Houses of Parliament, looking down the Thames, looking toward our site. And the British basically didn't want to see this building from the Houses of Parliament. And so they just described this kind of very they awkwardly- call it an iceberg. Yeah, we call it an iceberg. Yeah. This awkwardly um, uh, organized um, polygon that was, um, quite awkward and quite restrictive in terms of making sure that everything fit. And so the cubic form first became something that really efficiently allowed us to lay out the office spaces um, and give them great flexibility over time. Um, but then it also allowed us to keep a, a very efficient outward um, envelope um, and compact outward envelope uh, and oriented in, in such a way that the energy gathering devices could be um, part of the external skin. And we'll unpack that in just a minute. But the form then became, I mean, I think one of the questions that we were asked not only by the jury, but by, you know, many others was why a cube? You know, why, um, why not something goofier? You know, the London City Hall is down the Thames. Uh, um, you know, the shard is across the way. Um, and I think one of the things that we realized is that in representing the U.S. government and, and the American people, that this building is a symbol, um, wanted to take on something that was a little more serene. And so the cube proportionally became, from the Greeks, you know, a very serene, um, element that would hold up to the cacophony of all the other stuff that was going to be built around it, which we had no control over. You can see in this view uh, the site plan as developed by us placed back into the broader context of the whole Nine Elms district. So the left side is the Battersea development ongoing to this day, vast, vast development. Um, owned by a Malaysian development company with lots of different architects working on that. Um, you know, the opposite end of the band is Foxhall Station. But you can see the greenway down the middle and the engagement at the center of it, of our building. So it's kind of almost like a necklace, the, the greenway stretching along um, with the jewel of it literally um, sitting in the center of the, the new U.S. Embassy. I think as you, as you zero in on the site, one, you can see the three entrances uh, working from the east, the main entrance into the main uh, lobby from, uh, uh, you know, uh, from a shared surface lane. Uh, the uh, consular uh, CAC or pavilion to the south or the bottom of the drawing leading up a consular walk into the, that side of the building. And one of the things that we have to do is separate streams of people, you know, consular individuals uh, and workers from, you know, the people that are coming to visit or uh, gain visas and access uh, for business uh, to, the, to the embassy. And then a service pavilion to the side. The horseshoe-shaped um, diagram to the left um, became a site that the Department of State felt that they could eventually sell off, and I think it has been sold. 
Um, but one of the things that you begin to see very clearly is the greenway and those um, strands being round, wound um, into the site, um, being part of the wayfinding uh, to the entrances for the public uh, accessibility. But then this deep connection of, of the building and its site to the Thames by bringing water onto the site. And so, you know, metaphorically, we look across the pond to the UK. In this particular case, we look across our pond uh, to London. Um, and that pond connects us to the Thames. Um, it was uh, assailed um, in the British press as a moat. Um, we hope they don't um, resurrect that uh, again, but we can't be sure. Uh one of the aspects of this, we, we've talked a little bit about the building envelope, and we're going to come back to that in a moment, and the symbolism of that. And um, uh, the same can and should be said of the landscape. But if you look at this view of the building, and we're looking over the main entry uh, of the building, so from the east to the west, um, is that we worked with Olin throughout the process from the outset to also affiliate every security requirement for a building like this, first and foremost, not with security, but with a landscape typology. So um, I'll start with the pond. Um, call it what you will. Perhaps it's a moat. We're, we're calling it a pond. We're sticking with our story. Um, but <laughs> everybody likes water. Everybody likes water in cities. It's an amenity to the city. Does it perform a security function? Yes. Do you wander around the city looking at a pond saying it's a security function? I look at it as a pond. It's water. I'm going to enjoy it. And the, anyone in the city of London, any resident of the city, any visitor, has the ability to just walk right up to that pond, pass around it, sit at it. Um, it's a small urban park with water in it. Um, all of the um, plazas to the south side of the building are seating walls. They're seats where place where people can sit on. Do they also have a security function? Yes. Um, but the idea is systematically to work our way through this to build an urbane set of landscape relationships to this place that is the primary association people have with it. And um, you know, basically work through those affiliations to make those primary um, and the security functional but secondary. So your first image of the nearly completed building and the soon to be completed landscape, a kind of aerial uh, drone view that shows the cubic form, the swell of the outer envelope, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, uh, and the strands of the landscape leading to the uh, consular walk that is um, to the left of that image, the kind of arcing walk um, coming up through the, the consular CAC. And the foreground at the lower right um, is the main entrance pavilion and the, and the main drop-off area uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, um, of the embassy. And I think one of the things that um, Steve mentioned, but every one of these elements that we took on from a design point of view, we felt had to answer more than one question. It had to answer three, four, or five or more questions. One, to bring value to the aegis of you know, the government buying this building. But two, you know, in order to allow each of these design decisions to be so impactful that and so integrated that they weren't seen as just ephemeral and decorative, uh, but certainly performative and purposeful from a security and performance point of view. And so, um, you know, you'll see that as we unpack that. So at the ground level of the building, there's an engagement between interior spaces and exterior spaces or landscape spaces that you can, will share with you in both some drawings and some photographs momentarily. But basically, the public spaces of the building wrap around the core of the building at the ground level. And you can see a suite of those. Some of the rooms are outdoor rooms. To the left, there's a kind of ceremonial lawn out there for events. To the right, the main entry CAC. And inside, um, 
basic lobbies and entries for um, those who work in the embassy on the right or east side and those who visit the embassy and the consular side on the left. That whole public space zone wraps around uh, three sides of the building, obviously making for the consular entrance, but here you see an image um, during the competition and during the development of the main entrance where the seal uh, of the embassy in the United States is the names of the former ambassadors um, and where you're greeted um, to be taken up uh, into the embassy. And this view looks uh, along the Thames side, the north side of the building, um, uh, across a gallery space at the lower level that's accessible from the main entry level, from the main entry lobby above. You can see an art wall to the right. There's a considerable art program that will be going into the building later this fall into the early winter. Uh, but you can see through the windows above and out to the Thames uh, along that space. The lower part of that gallery is a series of meeting rooms, uh, uh, convocation space, if you will, uh, exhibition space that you know deeply connects these public space programs. The upper zone of that is a two-story height zone, roughly about 25 feet high, and then this takes you down another almost 15 feet into the lower level connected by uh, a glass stair and a glass bridge. Uh, we did have a crew over there two weeks ago, punch listing, and um, these are a couple of views they took. Uh, the uh, image on the uh, left side is an image of that space along the Thames, that double volume space we were just showing. There'd be huge artwork, wall-based artwork on that wall to your left. And the image on the right side is in the main entry lobby with the great seal in front of it. One of the things that we had unpacked from Saarinen's embassy is the, the crowded consular functions, not only for the staff, but also for those coming to get their visas and to get their passports uh, validated or renewed. Um, and the two-story consular section is connected, um, even though they're separated, connected by another two-story zone along the north side facing out over the park and over the Thames looking to Pimlico. Um, but, um, you know, open, uh, gracious, abundant, light-filled spaces that, um, you know, replace uh, uh, rooms that originally were designed for maybe 65 or 70 people that were at certain times were holding 225 or 250 uh, while lines also snaked around the outside of the building. Uh, the state of some of these rooms, again, a couple of weeks ago, across the top you can see some typical office spaces on upper levels of the building, really light-filled spaces. Um, uh, you know, only a maximum of about 40 feet ever from a window. Uh, huge amount of glare management provided through the shading system around the perimeter of the building, along with other functions. Uh, but really wonderful, flexible, light-filled workspaces. And across the bottom, a couple of images of the consular section of the building that um, James just showed a view of. And then the gardens that Steve referred to, you know, across the top, the Southwest Garden, these stairs that connect, three of the gardens connect to the outside and are full of real plants. And then three of the gardens are interior gardens that are both have um, interior planting, but also fictive landscapes as well. Um, and so this is, this is a, uh, uh, one of those interior gardens that does not connect to the outside, but gets uh, abundant natural light, but um, you start at a second story and work your way down the stair. And then the, the garden outside of the um, ambassador's uh, suite, um, which, you know, um, is both a gathering area uh, and their first introduction to the ambassador's zone before they go into a suite of offices. Each of these gardens has a suite of conference spaces affiliated with it, um, some staff areas, so they're, they're functional conferencing spaces throughout the buildings. Um, this is one uh, that we call the Gulf Coast Garden. You're looking through a stair that interconnects through the levels of the building uh, that we had described earlier and out um, beyond to the landscape beyond and the city beyond. 
those gardens were all oriented in the right direction relative to their disposition in the building and their intentionality of you know where they might be in the landscape uh, in the United States and this the Pacific Garden um, you know is you know on this on the south side in this particular case you know um, you know kind of fictive um, trees that are lit at night that allow for a place to go outside um, that is still secure and can't be you know entered uh, uh, from the ground but uh, enables people to leave the building while not leaving the building uh, you know again going back to some views as a way to introduce the facade drawings that we're going to conclude with this evening or facade um, photographs that we're going to conclude with um, you can see that the entire envelope of the building the roof and the walls are shrouded there are photovoltaic systems on the roof of the building the wall is shrouded in an ETFE shroud on a um, uh, aluminum frame wrapped around the whole perimeter of the building on three sides, east, west, and south sides of the building. So you can see that depicted here and here, some of the realization. So, you know, all architects are experimenters and we experiment with other people's money. Um, and if we're going to experiment with other people's money, then one of the things that you need to do is fail early and fail fast. And so one of the things that we did, um, both in terms of the disposition of this outer envelope, um, challenged by the jury, challenged by some of the peer reviewing, was, you know, how does this uh, envelope um, not only pull off the imagery that you're talking about and the symbolism of it, but how does it perform? And of course, the State Department was very concerned about this because, you know, one of the things that um, this was an unusual element that was won as part of a competition, but they wanted to ensure, you know, or reassure themselves that uh, this element had purpose and had use. And so the diagrams on the right are a series of about 75 or 80 uh, different diagrams looking at um, um, forming those chevrons, if you will, of, of um, ETFE uh, membranes uh, on their struts and shaping them in such a way that we can maximize both the energy gathering but also the shading elements of this particular uh, outer envelope. And then the glass wall behind, which is, you know, becomes the structure uh, that that outer envelope is uh, uh, supported from. The diagram at the lower right, you know, um, just talks a little bit about the energy gathering element of this that was part of the proposition. This building will perform at the highest levels of environmental um, performance that it possibly can, that any building can. It, it's uh, going to be a LEED Platinum building. It'll be a BREAM excellent building, which is the highest. Outstanding. Uh, outstanding, excuse me, the highest rating possible in the British system. Uh, but literally every aspect of the building is also doing environmental performative work. The pond is a heat sink as well as an urban amenity and a landscape feature and a security um, function. That's true of everything in the building. Everything's doing three, four, um, five jobs. Uh, but Ultimately, this building is developed. It begins with an energy deficit because of the nature of the program, and it gets to the highest levels of performance and even becomes an energy exporter to the district within which it sits. So just quickly unpacking the facade, you know, structural glass uh, performs the security membrane for the building, uh, working with our, our friends at Weilinger, now Thornton Tomasetti. Um, you know, to develop that secure inner envelope of which the outer envelope is supported and friable, but allows us um, this sort of uh, ever-changing um, uh, visage of this, this, this building and leads to the, uh, the kind of crystalline nature of the structure. Uh, you can start to see here how the form of this facade parts at the corners. Um, in between the corners as they turn. So you can see through to the inner layer at the corners. Um, uh, you know, but you can start to see the full array of the kind of crystalline-like structure of, 
on this new facade arrayed here um, with the struts from which it's attached at the bottom and top. If you look carefully in the view, you'll see three um, riggers in orange jumpsuits on the left side of the image. Gives you some idea of the scale of this. It's, it's a mountainous building. It's a half a million square feet, very tall stories. But these ETFE skins were basically set by riggers um, you know, with some mountain climbing skills, um, working from the top of the building down to uh, tension all those ETFE membranes across that aluminum frame. So we're going to take you through a series of views here. Uh, just to conclude, um, you know, the view from the Houses of Parliament or nearer to the Houses of Parliament, you know, looking um, west uh, toward Battersea. Um, and you can begin to see the kind of cacophony of the skyline that we couldn't have necessarily imagined what that might be and the stability of this within that particular, um, that particular other uh, skyline that's emerging. Uh, looking the other way from um, upriver a bit east, um, uh, back uh, toward the west, you can see. Yeah, looking east. Um, uh, I'm sorry, looking east from west, yeah. you can start to see the building um, along the river's edge there, the cubic form of it sitting there, and the envelope on the east face. Just a view of the kind of colonnade, the art wall that faces the pond and the park that's accessible and a view of what that looks like today as we are nearing the conclusion of construction. You can see this is from the north face of the building. You can see the colonnade around the base, the wall that becomes the base for that, the pond um, on the Thames side of the building. And you can see the corner in between the, um, the north wall and then the, the clad um, uh, west wall. Over wall. half that wall disappears because of the pond level you know, reduces the apparent height of that, of that wall, and then that wall has um, art um, incorporated uh, in it. We, we get a multiplicity of views. Um, and, you know, just going back to that, that comment earlier about how material and light work together to begin to form, you know, different experiences of the building. This is looking up through the envelope um, and the kind of, um, sculptural nature of how that um, envelope begins to modify your understanding of the building. In every light of day, across the day, across um, the weeks, and across the year, this envelope takes on different character. And you can see it here, um, you know, the, the subtlety of this. While the form is repetitive geometrically, um, it does not reflect the environment in a repetitive way at all. It's a um, crystalline form that catches light in different ways depending upon the particular angle of the sun, the intensity of the sun, the nature of the day. So in that way, I think it's, I think Steve and I believe that this is very much reflective of, of the United States, of, of American culture and society and, and you know, the, the ever-changing nature of our politics and our our, um, you know, our, you know, our daily lives. And, and so, you know, this becomes very much, uh, you know, a cultural icon that is very much a part of the kind of American fabric. Uh, here you can see it on a rather foggy London day. They're famous for them. Um, but you can see the kind of transformation of this into kind of a gray, almost metallic-like um, sheen or skin in terms of the way it's kind of just refracting that fog. And then the sun comes out, and you get a very, very different understanding of the building. And then the sun goes down, and it turns into a golden glow um, you know, on the landscape of London. And then just lastly, you know, we think um, a kind of parting image of uh, openness, transparency, crystalline, uh, welcoming, uh, you know, architecture that um, was incredibly fun to, to do with our clients and with our consultants uh, and to do for all of you. Thank you very much.
first, I just want to say a huge thank you to Steve and to James for giving us really a window into an extraordinary way of thinking and beautifully conceived and amazingly intelligently executed projects. I think, uh, Steve, if you create a thunder, I'm creating an echo. <laughs> um, I want to begin with one uh, sort of observation, and that leads to a question. And the first one is that you had a very clean arc from the beginning of a research that was self-generated and invented through the exhibition of the cellophane house. That skin generated energy, and the narrative arc concluded on a new skin that symbols the idea of the ethereal welcome of what diplomacy can mean when clearly there's aspects of hardening that are part of that story. So in each of these projects, I would say your attention from conception to being able to see the product fully realized takes that intensity from insight to execution. Talk a little bit about the London Embassy and how that kind of predisposition of your practice related to the way an embassy project is delivered. Uh, you know, one observation is there. there's certainly, you, you can't begin, or we couldn't begin with the London Embassy without some precursors to it. And for us, one of those precursors as a research trajectory was um, the use of um, plastic envelopes um, and skins on buildings, um, polymer envelopes of various sorts. Um, and that goes all the way back to the Cooper Hewitt exhibition. And, um, uh, and you try across time to advance an idea incrementally project by project um, when the circumstances warrant it. And we do lots of completely different non-glass buildings, lots of even concrete buildings, all concrete. but. There is a trajectory across this of a dialogue uh, that advances from that to cellophane house, where we actually wrapped it onto a real house, to an, an, another type of aluminum frame on the embassy that wraps it onto a larger building that is, is a sequence, and it needs to be a sequence. You can't um, go from a concept of how to actualize a material idea an innovative material idea all the way to the conclusion. You do it step by step, incrementally, trying to advance an agenda across time. And uh, uh, you know, the research agendas are thought of that way as um, questions that don't have definitive answers. They just have the next step along the way. It's true of all good questions. All good research questions and inquiries don't have answers. They, they have steps toward moving forward, but never a definitive answer. Just one comment on the materiality, but then going back to the London Embassy um, from a brief uh, point of view. You know, from the materiality perspective, ETFE has been used before. You know, we weren't the first to use ETFE on the outside of a building by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I think one of the things that we were trying to do is advance it from just being a simple fabric or skin um, as an environmental envelope to something that could become more performative as well. Um, there are other firsts that we've had, the first active curtain wall in, the, in North America, you know, and, and many others. But um, in this particular case, um, we knew that that was a risk, one risk too far probably. I think the other thing was, um, I don't think Steve or I have ever been, after our team and our consultants got done unpacking that brief and that competition program, ever so confident going to Washington to present that building as knowing everything about what the Department of State and OBO wanted into that building and, and integrating it in such a way that they were getting not just a programmatic result, but a highly performative 
uh, at multiple levels um, element that was going to lower their costs and ultimately perform so well uh, in the long term and be mutable. And, and I think we just had taken that program apart in such a way that um, it was sort of unassailable in a way. Now, the juror might say a little differently, but um, you know, it was, you know, it was unassailable to us. Let's just put it in those terms. Always is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's the sign of knowing that you've nailed it is when you've been able to not do one thing after another, but ultimately one thing because of another, so that there's a kind of unity, which I think has come through in all the projects. Um, but I want to go back to this question of research. I think, James, you said it so beautifully. We're all experimenting. We're all continuing our research, um, usually on other people's dollars. But you all are very unique in that you spent your own dollars, and you studiously carved apart some of your own dollars to say that there's some research that can't be funded mm -hmm. on a client basis, but that you feel such conviction that you've elected to actually create the space in your office, create the prototypes, and create the positions that aren't necessarily what I would call positions that could actually be covered uh, directly by clients. So talk a little bit about what made you choose to do that, and how has that inflected the projects you have done that have been outside of that pure research? Well, I'll begin, and, and uh, it goes back to refabricating architecture and the Latrobe Fellowship and the fact that uh, Steve and I, when we won that, uh, began to do research into other entities other than architecture. And in the manufacturing world, in uh, areas that products are being created, one of the things that we realized was that corporations and businesses and institutions all you know, reflect you know, some of their profits, some of their energy um, back into their business. And that was not necessarily a revelation, but a kind of permission that we should be doing that as well as a profession. Um, and, and that we felt that we could take a lead to do that. And so that's how we set that, that platform up initially um, and have grown it over time to be interdisciplinary. Um, um, and then deeply, um, through four iterations now, uh, that, you know, revamped it in such a way that they're deeply integrated into each and every project so that every project that we're working on is, is gaining benefit from that. Yeah, I, uh, it was hard to begin, and um, now it's hard to imagine life without it. Yeah. it it's been transformative for us, and we think, um, hopefully for the broader profession as well, to start to think we can have the agency to actually do that. We don't just have to accept the world and the products that are being given to us. We can actually advance the world and the products that we're making. And uh, uh, is it a financial, is that financially a difficult proposition? Yes. Um, but there's significant value added that we can demonstrate to clients, that we can get them to levels of performance that they couldn't have imagined before they began that is of value, not to all clients, but to some. Uh, we've also observed over time that we're able to take some things we make for clients to solve a particular problem or a particular circumstance, a particular question or query, as Billy Faircloth calls them, that we have. And then other people say, I could use that. And we've been able to productize some of that. In some instances, it's software. In some instances, it's hardware. Varies quite a lot, but um, there's the nascent capacity that we're just starting to realize today um, to actually um, make buildings, but also make products that make buildings that others can use as well. And that's a whole different way to think about how you can earn a living as an architect, as a, in part doing software development. And in all instances for us, that never begins by something we make up as an idea. We think the huge asset we architects have in the world is we have real problems for real people, real sets of circumstances. So we don't have to make up problems. Made up problems are fake problems. They're trite and trivial problems. But real problems uh, with you know, that are answers to real questions, questions 
that are really difficult to answer can sometimes develop products that are useful to lots of people. So, you know, we're starting to find that. It wasn't something we set out to do at the outset, but um, we're well, that, in it now. So. Uh, well, that leads to another question, and maybe, James, you were about to jump in on that one. Um, it seems that there was a certain point with the research studios at Penn, and since we both lead our research studios at Penn side by side, there was a moment where I think you were saying you felt that the whole notion was bankrupt, that either a six-week or 12-week problem couldn't begin to solve in depth, or even actually give the students something more than just that kind of race to the finish line. Mm -hmm. And so you all have elected to do these kind of series, whether it lasts ten, ten, uh, seven or 10 years with the Bangladesh thing, and it seems that simultaneously uh, you have been looking at the notion of building in places that are very low tech mm -hmm. and actually developing products that might be scaled and utilized in multiple ways. So it'd be interesting to hear both uh, how the studio maybe informed the kind of query of that and where is that taking you now in terms of that product that might scale to cultures that don't necessarily have all the kinds of uh, technical assets that we might have at our disposal. Well. I've often gotten myself into trouble. He's going to kick me under the table by saying, I, I think the Beaux-Arts tradition of education is bankrupt. And, you know, particularly in the context of, you know, six week and 12 week problems, you know, um, we understand that that's one way to measure, but it's, it's also one of those things that I think creates this sort of false sense of time, false sense of uh, completion um, or incompletion. Um, and sets up um, young architects to continue that kind of, um, that same kind of, you know, treadmill timetable as they go into offices and other things. And so the choice of trying to take a studio and learn from it, but then bring that information to the next year's studio and say, build upon it, and then, you know, continue to build upon the, that information from year to year is, is really important. One, it, it creates a sense of collaboration or it creates real collaboration in the sense that um, people look back on the work before and have to r respect the part of it that is um, um, real and true and reject the piece that they can reject um, through additional science and investigation and, and art. And so um, I think we both feel pretty strongly that that's, a, that's an important piece going forward. That certainly has informed the practice as well. I think the other thing that comes out of that studio is, is clearly the, the desire to share information. I think that's one of the reasons we write, we publish books, we put stuff on our, on our website that we share with the profession because I think that's the other piece that we saw coming out of Penn as students that, you know, it was all about, okay, the, I, I, I made this, I invented this, give me this, and this is mine, and this is mine, and this is mine, and I'm not sharing with anybody else in the profession any longer. And that, you know, that's just not how the world works, and it's not how this profession should be. It's very simple. Make sure you give her her glasses I'm, back. I'm, I'm giving her her notes back. <laughs> her notes back. <laughs> Kleptomaniac here. Um, the, on the professional side, you've asked about other cultures, and there is a product we have been working on for more than five years now with a venture capital group in India that is really the opposite of the embassy in some regards, and that it's very low-tech housing that can be assembled, um, you know, mass-produced and assembled on-site with very low-tech Labor, uh, off-site produced pieces, but assembled on-site with very low-tech labor um, that is also highly performative, um, but in totally different ways uh, in terms of how it manages environment and energy and um, in a country that is hugely challenged to have any infrastructure to support buildings in any way that we know in this um, country. So. We are, are working on collaborations like that, again, that are, are frankly fundamentally speculative, you know. And, um, you know, they, there's a huge market, approximately 50 million people a year coming into what we in the U.S. would call the lower middle class who want to move out of, a, you know, basically a cast iron sheet and bamboo dwelling into something solid. 
you know, and have, have a home. And, and uh, you know, so we find those things as energizing and fascinating, frankly, as anything else we do, and it's, it's challenging. So the woman with the, the very first image, the, the image of the woman in Bangladesh looking across the Ganges at the char, um, you know, a temporary plot of land that gets washed away through uh, monsoon, um, but is a point of habitation, I think is so profoundly um, striking it, when you experience that and you take students to see that, that if you're not moved by that um, and moved to then try to figure out a way that that could be how you might interpret aspects of, you know, a, a, a private house for a wealthy uh, in, series of individuals, or a very large complex with, you know, security requirements that have has a, an innate public component to it for the U.S. government, and bring that sense of that fundamental basic understanding of human condition to every aspect of architecture um, and what we're doing, that is what we're, what we're really learning from doing those kinds of things. And I, I have to tell you the feedback that we get from our students is that it's one of the most profound experiences that they've had. Um, we all can learn, we all need to learn how to design art and the art of architecture. But at the same time, I think one of the things that we need to understand is that compassion and that empathy for the human condition and, and that that fundamentally is a thread through every aspect of architecture. I, I, it's very interesting because what is very striking is that you all in many ways problem solve the way engineers do. But what most people don't know, and my father's an aeronautical engineer, is that for them the term elegance has nothing to do with the way it looks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It has to do with how much it can achieve with the least amount of embodied energy. Yeah. And yet I think that you all are similarly chasing down the possibility of elegance. But then when I think about that, you're chasing so far out there that I want to say, what's up with this project on Mars that you guys are working on? <laughs> can you tell well, us? One yeah. observation first on um, where we come from and the notion of the agency of materials. We're, we went to graduate school at Penn and when we came there, um, we, we came around the time Louis Kahn was dying, but I remember the question. He died the day I got accepted. He killed him. Um, but it's true. Um, I, I, he I remember the question, what does a brick want to be? And I don't, I don't know, I'm 22 years old. And I said, I came here for that. <laughs> and and um, I don't know, with age, I've come to realize that that is an incredibly yeah. profound question. Yeah. A brick is the most common material used in architecture across the world. You will find some variant of it everywhere on Earth and everywhere across history, uh, of the history of human beings. So here is this guy asking, what does a brick want to be? And um, I've since learned that that is a great question because there is no definitive answer to it. You can ask that question again and again on every project you do, and if you're willing to go deep with it, it'll take you someplace else. Mm -hmm. And it took him lots of different places along the way. And that place, interestingly, um, has technical components, to go back to where you began, but it always results in something that is absolutely stunningly beautiful because it resonates with every aspect of what we are as human beings. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I can think of it again and again. If you ask somebody like Picasso um, uh, how they work, you know, one of the things he said was, I never set out to make a work of art, never in my life. It's all research. You know, the basic message is if you want to make art, forget about it. Focus on all the other things that have agency to us as human beings in the world that are critical to us, to our survival on Earth, um, to our souls, and focus on all those things, and then the art will happen. It will, it will evolve, and you 
don't have to make it up. And it's going to be far more powerful because you didn't have to make it up. Anything you make up is always going to be trivial. Things that are deeply rooted to and connected to every aspect of our lives have profound meaning and we respond to them as beautiful. I think, Steve, that's a really wonderful way to kind of open this, this uh, sort of idea and ideals that you and James have shared with us as a kind of gift. I want to ask everybody here to have a huge applause for okay. what I would say is a profound and amazing thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.